Hi everyone, it's TJ90 here. Welcome to another episode on the series I Test Your Tactics. This time we are using a tactic straight out of Jake Cooper's Discord server. Once again, we're using Henku's tactic. It's a very attacking 4-3-3, three striker formation. Um, like me, he is also doing the Pentagon Challenge. He's worked his way around Europe and he's wound up at Newcastle, who he's got to a Champions League semi-final using this. So we've got a few teams picked and uh, yeah, without further ado, let's go and see what this tactic can do. As I mentioned last time, everyone, the uh, the purpose of these videos is basically if you've got a tactic you want testing, send it to me and I'll test it for you. My uh, Twitter uh, link is down below. You can DM me there or you can go into Jake Cooper's server and message me it there. And then we'll run the test and we'll see what the results are. So with this, um, we are using, I think, about 10 or 11 teams. Two teams that we've, uh, we've gone for were semi-selected by Henku. One of them is Spurs, because for his sins, he's a Spurs fan, much like I'm an Everton fan. So we've gone with Spurs and Everton. Now, I know after the last video, we said we wouldn't use Spurs again because we've done it twice and we've been sacked. Now, Henku did actually say that you can use the in-game editor to uh, prevent yourself from getting sacked. But um, that's not something I've done that much, and I've also not actually bought the in-game editor yet anyway. So we're just going to see how it goes. Um, but yeah, so this let, let's just look at the tactics. So it was, I believe, um, yeah, a custom tactic it just created off the bat. So uh, let's just have a look at what we've gone with for Everton. So, I mean, I'm an Everton fan and this is kind of what I would use it, um, like use it for myself. Um, so obviously I'd go Calvert-Lewin and Richarlison as the advanced forwards. Deli Ali is the deep line forward in between the two advanced forwards. And then it's very, I like it. It's very much just like a sort of traditional um nothing like too like fancy in terms of like Nazala's advanced playmakers it's the super effective I think uh attacking midfield role just um attack center midfield role with a supporting central midfielder individual instructions for both of them on moving to channels we've got Alan as the uh, the number six so just a straightforward defensive defensive midfielder defensive midfielder on defend two ball playing defenders and two attacking wing backs obviously as you can see we've got play out of defense which will work um, really well with these ball playing defenders and then you've got the wing backs bombing forwards. High tempo, so getting the ball forward nice and quick, hopefully, with the wing backs overlapping, hitting low crosses into the uh, into the middle. Um hopefully Calvert Lewin um won't be impacted on that because obviously he's such a good aerial threat. Hopefully he will still be able to get onto that. Um in transition, it's again it's very, very quick, just quick distributions, uh like long throws countering and counter pressing out of possession it's very much high defensive lines offside traps get stuck in preventing the the uh, short goalkeeper distribution it's just all about quick 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 basically smothering the opposition and um, the other teams have used so we've gone with club bruges we did and elect in the last one and we're going to try bruges in this one um you'll notice in the Everton one what i've kind of learned after the last few is leave a few spaces free and just let the assistant pick them just to keep the players fresh um, basically with Anderlecht we did okay but with Club Bruges they absolutely stormed it in the league so I'm thinking well actually let's see if we can get them to storm it in Europe as well we've then gone for Spurs you'll notice um, yeah attacking uh, lineup as you kind of expect in some regards Son and Kane as the strikers I'm going to give Benton Core the run at uh, defensive midfield and I'm just going to let the assistant pick who else he wants to play um, I was thinking either Mora or Bergwijn as the other advance forward, but we'll, we'll let the assistant pick that. In fact, I think obviously Region and we'll play Emerson actually as the wing backs. They can be our wing backs of choice. I imagine the assistant would have probably picked them anyway. Defenders wise, I'm, I'll just let him rotate between like Tanganga, Dyer, Davinson Sanchez. Um, who else have we got? Is that it? Is that all they've got now? As like outright defenders? Wow, okay. Um, yeah, where's, oh, oh, oh yeah, sorry, I'm Romero. I didn't see him then because he was uh, blued out and loaned, didn't automatically gravitate towards him. So yeah, Romero will probably be the other one who will play. Um, so then we then went with Leicester, Lille, Marseille, Leverkusen, Hoffenheim, Milan, Sassuolo. Sassuolo, I actually think, would be really exciting in terms of their front three. They've got Scamacca, um, Berardi and Raspadori. So Berardi's playing as the deep line forward. Raspadori on the left and Skamaka on the right and it'll be really interesting to see what these exciting strikers do um, like Skamaka you know has got 
really decent attributes. Raspadori, if you played much of this version of FM, you'll know he becomes an absolute monster. And then Berardi has just been Mr. Consistent, I found, on pretty much the last four or five football managers. He's just been a very, very solid performer. And again, we'll just let the... Uh, just let the assistant pick who else plays. It's probably going to be Consigli, I would imagine. He's going to be the better defender, uh, better keeper, sorry. Um, yeah, he would have probably picked him anyway, but we'll put him in. And then we've gone with Atletico Madrid because their front three, I think, will work really well with this. So we've obviously got the likes of Felice, Griezmann and Suarez. Um, you know, unreal, unreal front three. And then we'll just let him pick whoever else he wants to play. I imagine Correa may end up playing as the attacking midfielder, centre midfielder attack. It's not a natural role for him, but you know what? He might end up in that role. Um, I think it's a role he could do very well, um, looking at these attributes, but it's whether the assistant feels he can. Otherwise, he's probably going to be the likes of Llorente, Condogbia, Herrera, Coke, etc., and maybe Depal, but we'll see. Uh, and then Espanyol and Sociedad. Some of these teams, I'm not... I'm aware of some of the players they have, but not necessarily aware of like um, what's going to be the best roles for them. So um, we're going with Ayathabal as the deep line forward here and Isaac on the right-hand side. And then David Silva, I want to try him as the centre midfield attack. He's not the most athletic anymore, but his attribute, it's, it's like his technical and his mentals are so good. Um, I'd like to think he could do a decent job there. But yeah, we'll see what happens with that one. Could he potentially play? He could th potentially play as a deep line forward, to be fair. It's not most natural position for him, but he could potentially do it. Um, when you look at actually like the attributes he have, which suits that role over Oyathabal. I'm actually really tempted to put him there. And then put Oyathabal maybe on that hand side. You know what? That's what we're going to do. That is what we're going to do. I think it could be quite fun. So we're going to do that with, the, with Sociedad. Um, obviously, the rest of the teams, like I'll break down the lineups properly when we come to the review, um, because we'll look at the individual performances. But I just kind of wanted to show you an example of the tactic and some of the teams we're using and the lineups we're going with. So I'm going to run this test now, and uh, I will see you on the other side, everyone. Well, everyone, the results are in, and I have to say this tactic exceeded my expectations. Um, like you know, that's all I can say to be honest with you. Wait until you see some of the results we had. But first off, we've got to look at the big question is, did we survive with Tottenham? Of course we didn't. Of course we didn't. Three tactics tests we've done now, and we get sacked by Spurs and everyone. Although this time, I actually think we did quite well, because we lasted until March. In the last two, we've always been sacked before Christmas. Um, So... After seeing this, I was thinking, that's it. I'm sticking to my guns in future. I'm never, ever testing with Spurs again because we just get sacked all the time. But I've since had a thought, and I think every time we do a tactics test, we use Spurs because that will be the barometer, I think, of, of a tactics test is, does it survive Tottenham? And I think if it survives Tottenham then it's it's got to be, like, game-breaking. It's got to be elite level. You know, to survive Spurs, you know, would be... It is going to be the the marker of success. Now, as I mentioned before, that is not to say that this tactic was not a success, because, boy, it was. It did incredibly well. Um, I think the difference between this one and the Mixon one is it may have been slightly easier for some of the teams to adjust to this. It's a four-at-the-back system, so if you lose one centre-half it's easier to replace than if you lose a centre-half and a three-at-the-back system. Um, also, it worked on like a 4-3-3 rather than a 5-3-2, which I think for some of the teams that we used, and maybe there was an element of like subconscious bias in that regard, which may have affected the accuracy of the two. But generally speaking, um, you know, a lot of the teams that we used, even in the mix and one, the 5-3-2, their squad and like their... Um, like recruitment strategy over the last few years has been very much geared to a 4-2-3-1, 4-3-3, etc., etc. So therefore, to completely change that and go 5-3-2 and play strikers in roles that maybe weren't quite geared towards their natural attributes may have, you know, probably impacted on the slow start that we saw with a lot of teams. Likes of Ajax, even though they roared back to win the league, Real Madrid roared back from, like, bottom half of the table to come second. Um, you know, I think if... 
if you took control of those teams at the start of each season and actually took control, didn't sim it, you could make the tweaks needed to make it work quicker. Whereas obviously we were simming. So I think, you know, we lost that um, sort of cohesion benefit you could get from doing like match reviews, team cohesion, etc. in the training schedules, which would have obviously got the players gelling with that tactic a bit quicker um, and therefore probably would have got better results in terms of competition success. I think the way the mix and tactic finished with the likes of Ajax, Rangers, Real Madrid, etc. Um, I think another season of that, and I think you'd probably be looking at just wiping the floor with a lot of the competitions that they were in because it did seem that once things got motoring, they were just like unbeatable. Uh, like we said in the last one, Ajax didn't lose at all um, from like January or something like that in the league. They just won every game. Um, not even a draw, they just won it all, which is how they essentially just ended up walking the league. But we'll start with my team because, you know, they are my team, Everton, for my sins. And you'll notice that they came fourth. Champions League football secured for the Blues. Um, DCL, Dominic Calvert-Lewin, 32 goals in all competitions, which was um, the top scorer for the Prem. Richie Richarlison, he came third in the top scorer charts. And uh, we had Mikalenko who came second in the assist behind Bruno Fernandes. Um, knocked out in the semi-final of the Carabao by Norwich, of all teams. Sorry, Norwich. But, you know, they then went on to lose in the final. And we knocked out in the fifth round of the Cup by Leeds. Um, if we look at some of the player stats. Um, so, yeah, you'll see Calvert-Lewin. So, Deli Ali, Richarlison and Calvert-Lewin were the three attackers. Uh, DCL and Mitchie were the three uh, advanced forwards with Deli Ali. Um, as the uh, DLF, deep line forward. Van der Beek was the attacking central midfielder, um, CM on attack. 26 goals for, for Van der Beek, what a, what a hero. Um, we had Decore, who got an injury he was out for. What did he, sprained ankle ligament inside that, but he probably wouldn't have missed a huge amount of the season. 11 goal contributions for him. Mikolenko there, two goals, 15 assists in all comps, 13 in the league. Um Ben Godfrey was the only other player apart from Richie and the front three and the two midfielders, I believe, yet, yeah, who I um, specified that they play as much as you know possible barring injuries. Um, if we look at schedule, because, you know, as an Everton fan, as I'm sure everyone knows, all we care about is do we beat Liverpool, really, because that's how bad things have been recently. So they lost to Anfield 2-0. Any other noticeable results? Lost, got battered 4-1 by United. Drew with Chelsea. Beat Spurs 5-1. Sorry, sorry, Henku. They're your team. But yeah, battered them. Um, yeah, look at that. Lost to Norwich away 4-0 in, uh, in the cup. Beat Liverpool 5-0 at home on New Year's Day. Oh, that's beautiful. Richarlison, hat-trick for DCL and Mikalenko. Outstanding effort from the lads there. Beat Arsenal 4 0 at home, lost 3 0 away to City. What was the, the City result at home? 1 2 0. So, doing well at home against the big boys, just maybe not so well away from home. Man United lost away to Chelsea. Man United lost away. Okay. So, success with Everton because they got Champions League football and it did really, really well for individuals as well. Club Bruges, not so great if I'm being honest. Um, they came second overall in the league in their championship group. And I think um, they were initially were sat. Um, I don't even think they were at top of the table. No, they were third. So only three points behind Ghent. But obviously this is a, a league that Bruges have generally walked for the last few seasons. And in fact, the other tactics test we did where we managed and elect Bruges absolutely stormed it. But again, what you will notice individually, Bastost on... Um, 24 goals, leading goal scorer in the league. And Mawasa, sorry if I've murdered your name, uh, leading assister as well. In terms of competitions, they uh, they did actually get out of their group stage in the Champions League where they got knocked out by, by Chelsea. They won the Pro League Super Cup and they were runners-up in the Croaky Cup, which is like the Belgian FA Cup, basically. In their Champions League group, oh, I did check this yesterday. I think they had a relatively tough group. Um... Where is it? Dortmund, Lille and Salzburg. So, um, yeah, they came second in that group, which is pretty good going, I would say, for them, to be fair. Um, 
individual wise, we've already seen that Bastos did very well. Um, he got 33 goals, nine assists. Noah Lang, I didn't actually specify his role. I think he will have ended up playing as a deep line forward. 21 goals and five assists is very good. And then the other striker, Daniel Perez, 17 goals, two assists. And Hans van Nacken was the only other player we specified. We swapped him over, I believe, to play as the central midfield attack on the right-hand side. And uh, he did pretty well. What was that, 11 goals, nine assists? Uh, 11 goals, six assists. So, yeah, still worked well. Again, I think, you know, this one might be one of those where another season you give it time to gel and it does really, really well. Um, but, yeah, so still still worked quite well with Bruges. They didn't win the league, but, you know, they got out of the Champions League group, which is probably the first time they've done that in a long time. Not only did we get sacked by Spurs, we also got sacked by Leicester, who I can't remember when we got sacked by them. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, does it say, does my inbox go back that far? Um, no, only goes back as far as March. But uh, yeah, it doesn't tell us when we got sacked with Leicester. But yeah, not really worth discussing how they did because obviously we, we weren't there. Lille, um, Lille did well. They won the Trophy de Champion um, against, I think was it against PSG? Was it against PSG? Let's see. Um, yeah, beat PSG 2-0. That's like, you know, their community shield. They then um, got knocked out of the Champions League in Bruges' group. Um, they will have obviously got knocked out on head-to-head. -head. must have lost to Bruges at some point. Um, they then got knocked out in the second round by Lazio in the Europa League and in the quarters by Stade Rene. But they did come fourth, so they're playing Europa League football again next season. And uh, Jonathan David did quite well, um, as did Borak Yilmaz, if I remember. Possibly not, like, outstanding, but still decent. 32 goal contributions for David, 26 for Yilmaz. Jonathan Bamba did okay. He got 15. The uh, Xhaka, um playing in midfield, I think we put him... Oh, no, we didn't specify him, but I imagine he would have played as the supporting or the attacking central mid, actually, because we put Benjamin Andre in. Did quite well. Sven Botman, 10 goals, probably all from corners. Renato Sanchez, uh, 17 goal contributions. We also had Jeremy Pia getting 13 assists. And uh, Angel Gomez also getting 11 assists. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> again, I think this is another one you recruit well um, to have more like natural players playing in those key positions, attacking, etc. Like you your attackers and, you know, you probably storm it, to be honest with you. Certainly, certainly I would expect them to get Champions League football. Marseille were probably one of the biggest surprises for me. In real life, in the league, they were actually pushing PSG for quite a while, and then they've kind of just crumbled lately. But as you will see in this in this sim, five points off the top, five points off PSG. Arcadius Milik doing really really well, twenty six goals. Payet and uh, Payet, sorry, and Larola getting thirteen assists each. Um, in terms of overall competitions, I think they got to the semis in the cup, did they? Um, oh no, eleventh round by PSG. Knocked out in the semis of the Europa League by Lazio. Um, but yeah, the big one is uh, is the is the league, league one, where Dimitri Payet was the uh, top scorer for Marseille. Uh, Milik, 36 goal contributions. Cedric Bakambu, he did really, really well as well. He would have been playing as that other uh, advanced forward. Um, Payet, bossing it, 19 goals, 13 assists, all comps. Um, and then it uh, looks like this Dieng, he probably was rotated in and around Bakambu or maybe when, um, oh no, yeah, Milik and Payet played a lot of games. So yeah, it must have been rotated in for Bakambu. Guendouzi did okay as a supporting uh, attacking midfielder. I imagine they will have probably played Jerson as the uh, supporting, sorry, Guendouzi was the supporting central midfielder. Jerson looks like he was probably used as the supporting uh Midfield uh, attacking central midfielder, get me words right eventually. Uh, Balerdi, 10 goals, probably again from corners, but yeah, it, it just seems to do so incredibly well with like goals from multiple areas. You know, if you look here, just for an example, you've got six players on 10 goals plus, uh, and that was generally the theme across the board, to be honest with you. I think I found, um, because then if we go to Leverkusen, who came third, I believe, level on points with Dortmund, six points off Munich. Um, and then we've got knocked out in the DFB third round by Frankfurt, second round by um, Atleti in the Europa League. Sardar Asmoon did very, very well. Um, we played him as one of the attackers, if we look. 
Um, we had, yeah, Alario as Moon and Schick with Vert and Demibai as the midfielders. Um, and then if we look at the numbers, we've got Alario on 24, Schick on 19, as Moon on 18, Vert on 12. Um, okay, maybe not the best example here. Demibai got 20 assists. Um, but then if you look at, oh, was it Hoffenheim? Um, basically, there was, there was a few teams where you had like, plus 10 goals from six six players. I'm picking all the wrong examples here, but you look at this, Kramerich, uh, Babu and Rutter, uh, 15 goals minimum. Um, Baumgartner with the eight assists. David Raum with the 12 assists from the fullback. Um, and then if we go to Milan, Milan, everyone, drum rolls, please. Drum rolls. Oh yeah, sorry, actually, I haven't told you how well Hoffenheim did. You'll see they finished fifth in the league, getting Europa League football. I think their media prediction was eighth, so they beat that and managed to get into a into Europa League spots, which for Hoffenheim is not someone they've been for quite some time. Andre Kramerich was third. David Raum was 11th, or David Raum uh, got 11 assists and was third. And then if we go to Milan, like I said, everyone, drum roll here, please. Drum roll. Go to competitions. Domestic double. Not only did they win the Coppa Italia, they also won the league. Olivier Giroud with 31 goals. 31 goals, man. Um, unsurprisingly, he came up there, but not behind the man that is Chiro, who I think just basically probably just keeps the Capo in the air in, in, his, in his house permanently. You know, the top goal scoring trophy for uh, Serie A. I think, you know, Serie A just probably say to him, Chiro, you just keep it because, you know, don't worry about giving it back because you're always just going to outscore everyone. But Giroud, Teo and Rafa Leal, average ratings, top three. Teo Hernandez, second in the assists. Um, yeah, and like I said, they won the Coppa Italia. Who did they beat? I did check. Who did they beat in the final? They beat Sassuolo 6-1. 6-1, everyone. That is unreal. Let's see who scored in the final. Kessie Pen, Giroud. My man's Latan, Romagnoli, and a hat trick for Liao. It was in the. Was it a hat trick for Liao? No, just a two for Liao. Um, this this was one of the teams where you saw how um, well it worked for getting goals from across the board um, in a lot of ways. Because if you look at that, look at your strikers: Giroud, Rafa, and Zlatan getting so many goal contributions between them. All over thirty goal contributions between them, every single one. Brahim Diaz getting 35 goal contributions from that attacking central midfield role. Zlatan with the 33 goal contributions. Rafa with 40 and uh, Giroud with 43. So this was this is basically how we had it set up um, from that front three. And we just let the uh, assistant manager fill in everything else. Um, Sassuolo, they did pretty well, I feel. Um, they came seventh in the league, so they did get a European spot, Conference League. And as we saw, they did get battered by Milan, but they did get to the Coppa Italia final, which is incredible for Sassuolo. Um, in terms of individuals, we had Scamacca and Berardi and Raspadori doing reasonably well, to be honest with you. I think if you build the team up around them, um, and support them more, like say from midfield, you know, Maxime Lopez with 11 assists. But I think if you add like a quality attacking midfielder along him, like central midfielder on attack alongside him, I think, I think you know, you just feed that front three even more. And uh, I think the goals will just fly, to be honest with you, especially when you've got Skamaka and Raspadori, who are still young, still very good. In fact, Skamaka is wanted by some of the big guns in Europe. Uh, Raspadori, we all know how good he comes. So yeah, I think I think with Sassuolo they would have probably stormed it, um, like you know, in a season or two. Sporting, I think they did the usual. They yeah yeah they won the league quite comfortably. They were runners up in the Allianz Cup, knocked out in the Taca de Portugal placard uh, by Benfica, won the Super Taca, so their Super Cup, knocked out in the quarters of the Champions League by Chelsea, which was very unlucky. Um, I'll show you the tactic and the way it's set up with these. Um, but we had Sarabia as the deep line forward and Edwards as the advanced forward on the left. Nunes, Gonsalves, Pedro Gonsalves, um, who just is just class, um, and Polina. And then I think basically we left the rest free, but we kind of assumed that um, 
Pedro Paro would be played on that right hand side, um, the wing back on the right. And let's see, did he get the assist that would suggest that? But if you look at Marcus Edwards, it's not even like really a natural striker. His natural position is that right wing, but 41 goals in all comps. And then we've got Paulinho, who obviously the assistant manager decided he was going to play as that other uh, that other striker on the right-hand side. Got 38 goal contributions. Pablo Sarabia with 40. Pedro Gonçalves, 17 goals from that attacking midfield role. And then we've got Islam Samani, who also played. Look at that, 15 goals, and he only started once. Um, Nunes did quite well there. And let's see, where's Pedro Porro? Where is Pedro Porro, everyone? Have I gone past him? Am I just scrolling right past him? So we had another fullback there, Ricardo Esquel, who got 14 assists. I must have completely gone past Pedro Porro. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait. Pedro Porro was on loan, I believe. So he will have gone back to City? Hey, so we found him, Pedro Porro. Um, he got 16 assists in all comps, three goals. So yeah, he was probably the, one of the main creative outlets for this team. And now all that's left for us to do is take a little hop over the border from Portugal into, well, into Madrid. Not quite over the border, though, quite far away from the border, but over into Spain. As you will see, Atletico de Madrid came second, one point behind Barcelona. Um... They um, came third in their Champions League group. What are the odds on that? Man United on 13 and the other three teams all finishing on seven points. But despite that, they didn't let that sway them and they went on to win the Europa League with Luis Suarez getting 10 goals. I want to say 16 goals and 10 goals um, in, I guess, what can probably only be described as... It could be like one, two... Let's say 13, 14 games, maybe, um, which is an unreal run of form. In fact, let's see. Let's go on Suarez and let's see. UEFA Europa League, 10 goals, one assist in seven games. Just phenomenal. The man just does not decline. I mean, look at his attributes still. He's 35 and his physicals are still pretty decent. Um, in terms of other results, um, yeah, poor in the Copa del Rey. Um, didn't do much in the Super Copa. In terms of the squad, <coughs> sorry, we had Jao Felice as the deep line forward, 29 goals, Luis Suarez, 27 goals, Anton Griezmann, 24 goals. Fairly even split of goals coming from all of those players there. Angel Correa, he would have probably been used in the midfield, 10 goals, 5 assists. Koke, I think he would have probably been used as the supporting midfielder. With Rodrigo De Paul also weighing in with a fair few contributions. Daniel Vass, I think he he must have been played as that right wing back. 17 assists, man. 17. And um, who else did they have? Renan Lodi didn't do a huge amount. Um, if we go on to... Um, oh, I was going to check something then. What was I going to check? Oh, yeah. Let's see how they fared individually. So we had Jao Felice, 20 second, uh, 22 goals second. Um, Mikel Oyadabal leading the way and Diego Rico also coming second one behind Gaia in the assists sorry Espanol we're just going to jump over you for a second and go straight on to Sociedad because Oyadabal there 40 goals in all comps now we played him didn't we as the um, advance forward on the left hand side of Isaac and Silva in behind and Marino in midfield now Sociedad as you will see came third which I think in itself is incredible um, because they finished above Real Madrid, admittedly on goal difference, but look at that goal difference. 56 over Real Madrid's 28, Atletico 57 over Barcelona's 45. So one thing that we noticed, obviously I'm just looking at this one right now, um, is that both teams um, who were used in this tactic, not including Espanyol, because you know they finished a bit further down, we'll come on to them in a minute, but both teams who finished, you know, who excelled with this tactic, given the personnel they had, outscored everyone else. Not only did they finish third, they also won the Copa del Rey, um, which was is incredible. I think it was really, really good going for Real Sociedad. Don't get me wrong, they've been in and around there the last two seasons or so in real life alongside Athletic Club Bilbao, but to actually, you know, win it 
Um, who did they play in the final? Let's see. They beat Barcelona 6-1. So we've had Milan. Oh, we can't even look at that. That's annoying. But we've had Milan beat Sassuolo 6-1 in the Copa, uh, Copa Italia final. And we've had Real Sociedad beat Barcelona 6-1 in the Copa del Rey final. Henku, what have you created here, man? What have you created? If we look at the squad, let's look at the numbers. Oh, yeah, that's about 54 goal contributions. Wow. What an absolute machine that man was. Considering he's not an actual striker, he's more of a, a advanced playmaker, winger, inside forward, whatever. Isak, 29 goals. We had David Silva, 30 goal contributions. Is that deep line forward? And then we've got Porto. I imagine one of the players, the, I think, did we have him as the wing back or he may have played in midfield? Um, 19 goal comps. How did our fullbacks do? Not, not amazing. We had uh, Gorazabel getting 12 assists. Not bad, not bad at all. Um, Diego Rico getting 17 assists. Um, where did they play him? Because we had Ian Munoz. Oh, maybe Munoz got injured for him to only play 19 times and Diego Rico to have played more. Probably for the best, looking at those numbers. And then that does bring us nicely onto Espanyol, recently promoted into a, into Serie, uh, Serie La Liga. I think they did pretty well. 11th, knocked out in the semi-final by, uh, by Real Sociedad, the eventual winners. And I think coming 11th, to be fair, a newly promoted team, Getting knocked out in the semis of the Copa del Rey. Look at that. They've got to make an 11-point gap up to the European places. So you think, obviously, they stay up. Good finances. You recruit well. You you, take, you can bridge that gap. And if you look at their average league positions, slight dip to begin with. And then fairly steady throughout the rest of the season. Um, respect on Espanyol. Let's look at the overall stats. Standout performer, unsurprisingly, RDT, Raul de Thomas, their main man. Lauren on loan from Batiste did okay. Landry de Mata did okay. He excuse me. He obviously got injured. How long was he out for? Damaged cruciate ligaments. That's why he's hardly played. So he only played up until Christmas. And then um Roulet came in, sorry. <coughs> and did okay. I look by looks things as an understudy. Manu Milanes, I think is he on loan from Zelta? Either from Celta or Villarreal, I think he will be on loan from. Did quite well, 17 goal contributions. Tony Villena, or Villena, Dutch, uh, Netherlands people, Dutch people, you have to tell me uh, in the comments if I'm pronouncing that right. I'm probably pronouncing it horrifically wrong. Otherwise, yeah, nothing nothing else like to write home about with Espanyol in terms of numbers. But, like, you know, I think... Again, it's a tactic that would work very, very well um, for any team. I think really, like the low, like even if you go quite low down, I still think you'll find the numbers, like you'll find the players to make it work. What can we say, everyone? That's two of your tactics I've tested now, and I think both have shown their merits. And I think we've struck gold to an extent with both of them. I know we've had mixed success across the board. Um, I know that with uh, with Mixons, we, we possibly struggled with some of the teams that we maybe wouldn't have expected to. But I think when you look at that um, retrospectively and look at the teams you were using and the players they had, um, I think you gear your recruitment and, and those those results will just continue to pick up. But here with Henkus, we had some instant success straight away and we gave a lot of teams a really good foundation to build on, uh, you know, competitively looking at Espanyol, Sassuolo. Um, you know, doing well in their cup competitions. Real Sociedad obviously winning it. Milan bossing domestically in Italy. Um, Marseille probably being the surprise package and coming second, only five points behind PSG and Ligue You know, I think this tactic, use it. Recruit where you need to recruit to maximise those front three strikers. Find yourself a good attacking central midfielder who's going to make those runs. Arrive late in the box. It's got a good finish on him. Um and I think you'll be laughing. Obviously, your wing backs as well are going to be important. But with a lot of those teams we used, um, they already had good wing backs. So, you know, we have to sort of bear in mind that this tactic worked really well for like 10 teams. Um, however many it was, we were still in charge of at the end. And, you know, I think I think like the Mixon one, I think it's got the potential to probably be useful across the board in some ways. But like with any tactic, it's only as good as your personnel and it's only as good as you who are using it. Um I think, you know, I think the idea of a plug and play tactic is sometimes can be a little bit false. 
And I don't think you learn the game as well as you could do just using a preset downloaded tactic, which just you plug in and you just win. I think every tactic you need to work on to make it work. Um, but I think the two tactics we've tested will give you a really good foundation for that. Um, that's just my thoughts on tactic building anyway. Um, but yeah, I think these two tactics that we've used so far, definitely give them a go. Even if you're new to the game and you want just a little bit of help along the way, give these a try. You know you'll get results with them. And then as you get used to them, you can tweak, bring in the personnel. It, I think they'll just be a really good experience, learning experience for you. And if you're new to Football Manager, equally for you old hands, both, I think you could make work incredibly well. This one, you know, you're going to get goals from, um, you know, when you look at the, the goal contributions across the board. Um, I've waffled on quite a bit now in this supposed quick outro. Um, but yeah, um, thanks again for watching, everyone. If you've enjoyed the video, leave a like down below. Um, leave a comment if you got any thoughts on it. Um, if you've got a tactic you want me to test, go to the links down below and I will do it for you. And uh, yeah, if you're enjoying it, subscribe. It means a lot. I'm not just saying it because it makes things look good on the numbers. It just means a lot to me because it means that if you subscribe, you want to keep coming back because you're enjoying the videos that I'm doing. And that tells me that I'm doing a reasonable job. So yeah, I really appreciate it, everyone. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you on the next tactics test. Bye.